Hello, BioSci 101. This is Dr. Georgie, and this week's lecture is more in depth about fluorophores and basically fluorescence microscopy with it, right? If you happen to have a book or a PDF of it or access somehow, um, this is where some of this is found. And again, you can go to the Davidson website. If you just Google Davidson microscopy, there's a lot of great info there. So um, this is a follow-up to last, uh, well, not the research um, design lecture or scientific method lecture, but um, the lecture on fluorescence and fluorophores before, I organized the types of fluorophores by whether they're conjugatable. In other words, can you chemically um, link them to something like an antibody? Um, or whether they're cell permeant, so you can just add them to cells and they'll go through the plasma membrane. Um, I made a grouping for you of some nuclear dyes and then a fourth grouping of the proteins that are fluorescent and um, can be genetically added to cells and tissues and embryos and so on. And I wanted to just point out to be super clear, which of these categories can be used in uh, live cells or live imaging versus which ones are necessarily used in fixed tissue. So any when we're talking about conjugatable um, fluorophores, like for instance, Alexa 488, um, FITZE, which is also known as fluorescein, rhodamine, all the classics and the first uh, kinds, obviously. Um, we're talking about imaging something that is fixed. So it's dead, it's stopped in that time and place and you can image it um, to your heart's content except for issues as you'll see like bleaching. Um, but you can make a slide and keep it generally up to a year. They're still good if you put them in the freezer and keep them in the dark. Um, freezer's a bit of an over precaution to be honest. Um, but when you work hard to make a slide, you kind of get attached to it. Um, so if it's fixed, you can image it today, tomorrow, months from now, that's the idea. Um, nothing's going to change. You've killed it, you've embalmed it. It's, it is what it is. But of course, we're biologists. We like to study things live and we like to also mess with them and see what happens. Um, and so one of the first ways to do that was through a series of cell permeant dyes, interestingly enough, by the same guy who gave us GFP. So his name is Roger Chen and his lab developed some cell permeant dyes. And these are still used. They're, they tend to be fairly nonspecific, like, oh, you know, it's a cell and it's fluorescing. Okay, well, sometimes that's useful or a little bit hard to use. There's some calcium dyes that change with the amount of calcium um, and they can be a little bit tricky to use, uh, to be honest, but you can do live experiments with them. Nuclear dyes come in both varieties. Some are for live specimens, some are for fixed specimens. And then the fluorescent proteins are what really gave a boost to live imaging because um, they're easy to use. They don't affect the cells. Um, they're not toxic at all. There's you know so many colors that you can use. They really spawned a revolution in imaging, which is why um, fluorescence imaging is the number two most used tool in uh, biology these days if you, uh, well, and genomics and DNA sequencing is, which is a lot of different things, is considered the number one tool. So we're right up there after a whole bunch of things. And then there's fluorescent scopes. Um, so we're just widely used everywhere for all sorts of things, including these days diagnostics. Okay, so when you're thinking about a, or, or, <coughs> excuse me, a particular fluorophore, um, things to think about or to you're, you're choosing basically you're like shall I use this fluorophore in my experiment um, there's several characteristics of that particular fluorophore that you might want to consider and if you're buying it from a company um, basically molecular probes is the company <laughs> it's owned by Invitrogen which is owned by life um, that's a company <laughs> it's a giant company um, 
so but when you're buying it and um you or borrowing it from somebody borrowing it not to give it back but i guess uh, being given some from another lab here are four things you want to think about besides of course can you see it on your scope so now we're just looking at the chemical properties of the floor floor not whether you have the you, you've already checked to make sure that you have the proper filters on your scope so you can actually see it so you already know about um finding out about its like citation and emission spectra. So the peak and also what does the spectra look like? As you're gonna see having the actual spectrum for each spectrum is singular, spectra is plural. So having the actual um, info is really, really important for a lot of reasons. And if you're using a commercially available fluorophore, then you can just look it up. And do you, uh, I'm like, how much do I want to give away some of the ending here? But let's foreshadow a little bit. It's pretty good when you look it up, but it's not always completely accurate, okay? Um, then you want to know the Stokes shift, um, which you'll know it, once you've found out the excitation emission um, peaks, the spectra, you can easily calculate the Stokes shift or you can get lazy and have the website tell you. Um, we like small Stokes shifts usually, but anyway, that's a characteristic of fluorophores. And these are characteristics that make some fluorophores more adopted and wise, what, more widely used than others. So a big one, and this one's new, um, new to you guys at this point in the class. So big, huge one photostability. Basically, well, how much can you look at it before it quits working? Will it disappear on you? Answer, first of all, it will disappear on you. <laughs> um, but how much can you image it before it is what is known as bleached? So as you can imagine, you want to be able to image something over and over again. You don't want to just be able to image it for 20 microseconds and then it's gone because you're trying to focus and whoops oh gone in real life this is one of the still biggest issues when we're imaging um, most specimens on a scope this is why you're going to be super popular <laughs> in whatever lab you end up in because you're going to be really good at setting up a scope so that everything's good to go because you know what you're doing and you're not going to bleach stuff much because, for instance, you're going to be able to look in the oculars and just go, oh, I bet I know how long <laughs> I need to expose this fluorophore for, et cetera. Basically, the more you do it, the better you get at counteracting photostability because you're able to quickly figure out the parameters to take a good image and you can take a good image the first time. You don't need it. Um, futz around and try 30 different things and oh there goes my <laughs> floor for I can't see it anymore. Um, a very useful thing to know about a floor for is also its quantum efficiency. So let's look at these new characteristics and I'm going to actually start <laughs> by telling you one that's not on the list. Um, there, but just so you know, for your own uh, information, there's also something called molecular extinction coefficient. And it refers to the ability of a fluorochrome or fluorophore to absorb photons. So how hungry is your photon? I mean, your, um, your molecule, your fluorophore for photons, because you're going through a lot of effort to buy a really bright, high intensity lamp. Um, or, you know, to develop an LED that's bright enough, which we have finally achieved, and to make sure you have enough of the light of the right color, maybe you're even giving it a laser, you know, <laughs> that's a lot of effort to give it a lot of light. And if your fluorophore is going to uh, absorb only 10% of that, it's useless. <laughs> and um, you want it to absorb as much as possible of all that light you went to a lot of trouble to deliver to it. 
But here's the thing, and this is why I didn't list it in the four key uh, aspects. Most floor floors that are commercially available have a very similar molar extinction coefficient. So when you're picking between floor floors, it's usually not a big consideration because they're all pretty similar in their ability to absorb light. Um, what does vary a lot, however, is how much of that light they, they emit as, as colored light as opposed to as heat. Because remember that um, when they absorb the fluorescence, when a fluorophore absorbs the fluorescence, this is described by the Jablonski diagram, when it absorbs the fluorescence, it's going to emit a different color of light and some heat. And you want it to emit mostly more light. <laughs> you don't really want it to emit heat. That's just physics. It's necessary. You can't get around that. But you would like it to emit most of the light it absorbed to re-emit it as light and not give up so much heat. So that's called the quantum efficiency or quantum yield. In other words, um, you know, what fraction of the light that it absorbed is emitted as fluorescence and the rest of course is off as heat. So the higher the quantum yield, the better. The more light it gives you in return for the light you gave it basically, <laughs> the better. And um, when you look up fluorophores for assignment spectra, which is probably going to be next week um, in lab for some of you and later on in the semester for other um, uh, folks, when you do that lab and you're looking, I'm going to have you look up fluorophores and you can see that there's a description sheet that goes with each one that tells you this one has X amount of quantum yield. And, um, you know, we're super happy with something like 70%. That's amazing, actually. Um, if it's only 20%, um, you won't even see it. Like, people aren't going to sell that, because why? Uh, it's not really going to work. Um, so there's a set quantum yield that a fluorophore has when it's in solution. And you can do this easily with a spectrophotometer. You can measure the amount of light that is delivered. You can measure the amount of light, which is a different color, of course, right? Um, the amount of light that is uh, emitted. And um, it's, a easy, it's easy to figure out. But here's the thing. That's what the sheet is going to tell you. If you look up. Um, the info about your fluorophore from molecular probes, it's going to give you a number, 72%, let's say. That's in just in solution. It's just the fluorophore itself and nothing else. Um, in the real life conditions, that varies a lot, <laughs> actually. <laughs> In a, in a way that actually affects your experiments. And again, this is, if you're working, if you're running an imaging core, this is the thing you're gonna help scientists troubleshoot because they're gonna be really puzzled. They're gonna say, well, I put this floor for, you know, in these cells and it was super bright. And then I tried it in this cell line or these, you know, this organelle or this part of the cell and it's not working. I don't see anything. And then you're going to have to figure out, is it a different scope? Is it a different filter set? Or is it a quantum yield issue? Pretty much all the troubleshooting and fluorescence microscopy is, why can't I see it? <laughs> why is it so, why is everything black? Why is it so dark? You know, like I want to see my green and red. Uh, I want to see, I want to see some color. Um, so what is going on? Why is it not as bright as it is in just a tube. And even sometimes you do that in a lab. You're like, is this floor for working? Let me just put it in some solution and, and just test it. You can make a blank, um, you know, a slide with just some solution on it, no cells and see what, you know, is it fluorescing? Can I see it? Oh yeah, super bright. So what's going on when it goes, it gets into cells? Well, pH, pH affects it a lot. And that's something most people don't know because most biologists 
um, for whatever reasons, tend to avoid pH and avoid thinking about it. And they tend to assume that all parts of an organism have the same pH, even though we know perfectly well that that's not so, <laughs> okay? And um, pH varies in different compartments inside of a cell. And often that's significant, it's significant to your ability to see the fluorophore, but it's also always very significant to the cell. And um, cells doing a lot to create different pHs. And sometimes the cell is in acidosis or alkalosis because you cultured it badly, you're growing it badly, you've stressed it out. <laughs> so that can account for um, why one week it's bright and another week it's not. Um, maybe there's a contamination in what you're growing and um, bacteria are taken over, that affects the pH. All kinds of things affect pH. And um, I think one of the reasons that we tend to avoid thinking about it is because it's actually quite hard to measure the pH of uh, the specimen that you're looking at. Um, it's hard to do it accurately. There are pH sensing dyes. Um, I did this actually in my PhD and I, and I can testify that there's a good reason uh, to avoid it if you can, but the thing is you can't forget about it just because you can't measure it or it's really hard to measure in real life conditions to get good accurate measurements. Um, it's important to at least remember that this is happening to the cells. Okay, then we also see that sometimes if we're attaching, for instance, a fluorescent protein to a particular molecule, occasionally that um, combo will be a little bit dimmer. So fortunately, most fluorescent proteins are so small and they're just a tiny little, tiny little tube basically attached to the protein. And they, they tend to work really well, but I, you know, not perfectly, not every time. And in general, the overall chemical environment is going to floor, uh, I mean, it is going to affect your fluorophore because your fluorophore is um, chemical too. Everything's a chemical, right? And so other things like um, reactive oxygen species bouncing around, even oxygen um, can degrade a fluorophore and, you know, just whatever else is around <laughs> could be the cause. That's a pretty broad statement, but it's sort of covering. And then think about whatever you know, maybe weird stuff that you're doing in the experiment, like giving it too much oxygen or something, maybe on purpose, but that will make your floor four possibly dimmer. So quenching is the term for having less quantum yield um, because you've attached it to a molecule. So diminished quantum yield due to conjugation to molecules, such as a protein. So when we use the fluorescent proteins, which are tiny little proteins, and we usually are attaching them to another protein in a cell, sometimes we get quenching. It's not uh, super common, but it's also not uncommon. It does happen, you need to you know, run the experiment and see if it's happening. And then figure out a way to attach your fluorescent protein to a different part of your overall big protein that you're trying to look at. Okay, so let's talk about bleaching. So bleaching is awful, <laughs> okay? We're, we spend a lot of time and energy fighting bleaching. It's also known as photo bleaching. It's the same exact thing. It depends on whether you wanna say bleaching or photo bleaching in that moment. And it's the permanent loss of the ability to fluoresce. So once you bleach something, it's gone. You went through all that work to prepare your specimen, fix it, stain it, or you know, genetically modify your cells so that you now have a fluorescent cell line with um, your fluorescent protein attached to your protein of choice. And you're full of ideas of exciting experiments to do with it. And um, you've got to image quickly <laughs> because <laughs> your fluorophore is bleaching. So you look at it and you're like, yes, I can see it. Let me, let me play with the exposure and the, the white balance and the, oh, it's gone. 
it's gone. No matter how much light you give it, it is dead. It is gone. It is not, not your cell. Your cell's fine. It's your fluorophore that has died, basically. Um, it's never coming back. It is not going to recover. It is horrible when this happens, and it's inevitable. And almost everything you do, um, especially in a real life sort of research, biotech, diagnostic setting, the things that we're looking at are going to bleach. And so we need to start out with the brightest amount, the most, you know, the best possible situation so that we have the most latitude to take images. But um, you can't take, just keep taking images forever. This is not like H&E, for instance, which actually, no, take it back. It actually also bleaches and degrades over time, but it's a lot slower and a lot longer. Um, with fluorophores and fluorescence, we're talking seconds, actually less than seconds, depending on the conditions and the fluorophore and what you're looking at. Um, you might be lucky to get a second of viewing out of it, which is several images usually, um, but um, multiple seconds if you're lucky. Um, if you're if you get minutes of observing it, then you're just like thrilled. It's like, oh my gosh, this is the most photostable floor forever. Photostability is basically the ability to resist bleaching. So in the list of floor fours you learned about, you learned about Fitzy or fluorescine, also known as, which was the first green floor four that we had. And then I told you that uh, Doug Hagland, um, well, I may not have named him, but anyway, a scientist at Molecular Probes developed a series of uh, fluorophores known as Alexa, this and that and that other. There's a whole bunch of them if you go look them up. And um, that was because, and they took over. Now pretty much people use Alexa 488, not Fitzy. Why? Because Alexa 488 is much more photostable. And then that was just chemistry, um, not just chemistry. I mean, yay chemistry, basically. Uh, it was playing around with um, the structure of the molecule to make it more photostable. So, um, why does bleaching happen? We know, we know why. Um, th again, thank you, chemistry. It's because the light is damaging the molecule <laughs> and also because there's oxygen <laughs> around and oxygen just likes to run around and wreck things. And so you've changed your, the shape of your molecule. It's no longer able to react, basically. It's like I give only X amount of reactions and then that's it, it's over. Are there exceptions to this? Yes, actually, there are some molecules that blink that um, temporarily bleach, and I may talk about them at the end. Um, there are some fancy, uh, really fancy um, fluorophores like Trompa and so on, DRO and PA. Um, and interestingly enough, autofluorescence tends not to bleach. Hmm. And why? We're not sure. <laughs> So stay posted for, for breakthroughs, maybe you'll make them actually about this. But for now, all the fluorophores we work with, even in immunofluorescent staining and diagnostics, um, that's IF staining, we'll talk about it a little bit later more, but basically everything bleaches. So assume that your molecule, that your fluorophore will bleach, assume that if it's fluorescent, you don't have much time to look at it. Um, when you get back in lab uh, in the fall, you'll see that we have some beautiful slides that um, are made from, in, from molecular probes and <laughs> they're triple stained and it's sort of entertaining at 4X, you can go around and you can see circles <laughs> like areas where they've been bleached. So cell, cell, cells, and then a circle of darkness. <laughs> and then no cells. So somebody previously has observed that part of the slide and uh, you can tell exactly where they were looking at it. Um, so yeah, bleaching is real. Bleaching is a big thing. Bleaching is just something you've got to deal with. Um, here's an example of um, a triple stained uh, cell. Um, it, it's clearly grown 
in cell culture because it has two nuclei in it and that happens a lot and it's a weird thing that happens when cells are grown in a lab for a while um so you see the two blue nuclei and then you see um i got this from the davidson website and i'm i think the red is mitochondria and the green for sure is actin because i just recognize how it looks actin is the protein that makes up meat it's also present in all of our cells in meat cells muscle cells it's just organized um in a phenomenally organized way in regular cells it's kind of all over like you see it here in green so this is basically turn on the shutter and hold it open this is also why there's always a shutter with um, a fluorescent um, lamp because you have to turn the lamp on and keep it on um, once you've turned it on if it's something called an arc lamp and so but you don't you need a shutter you don't want to expose your specimen um, the whole time to it. But if you don't shutter it and you just leave it open, this is what you'll see. The green almost very quickly within um, less than a second. I'll show you some with time scales in a moment. But um, the green is going to go away really fast. And uh, the blue was the first one to disappear, if you notice in this sequence. And um, the red is, is disappearing too, but it sticks around a little longer. So here's another thing for you to know that bleaching is fluorophore dependent. So some fluorophores bleach more than others, but also in general, <laughs> the more energetic the fluorophore, the more it bleaches. So um, in other words, blue bleaches the most, green the next and red the least, but red bleaches too. So you can you need to know that because if you're looking at something like figure E and you don't know if anybody's looked at this slide before, you might think, well, it's only a dull stained slide or the third stain didn't work. Yeah, that might be true, but actually in this case, <laughs> it, it was because somebody had been observing it before. And when they took pictures of it, they saw a triple stain slide. This is why you have to do controls for everything. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more um, in this lecture too. And also keep good notes and know what you're looking at, know if other people have looked at it so on. Okay, so what can we do about this? Can we do anything? <laughs> yes, yes, we can. Um, we usually mount our specimen in um, some sort of anti-fade solution. So um, it's called bleaching, but the solution, <laughs> the thing you use to solve it is called an antifade. And um, they usually have some sort of what's called an oxygen scavenger. So something that binds to, um, well, oxygen radicals, if you remember your chemistry, uh, they're the same thing that cause rust. So <laughs> they just get into all sorts of trouble. They love to destroy things. So you're gonna kind of trap the oxygen, which is the main, cause that you can control and then you're going to try not to look at it too much and just look at it uh, you know expose it to as little light as necessary um so <coughs> mounting media excuse me mounting media is just a general name for what you're gonna put the specimen in and mounting media can be all kinds of things it can be resins epoxies it can you know be soft and then harden with time it can be something called oct if you're doing histotech if you're doing a cryo um a cryotome it, there's lots of things that we mount our cells or specimens or tissues or whatever it is we're looking at um, when we put it on a slide and then what's the the fluid that we mounted in fluid which in some cases in histotech becomes solid but um this is about refractive index <laughs> if you'll think back you you want to have a certain refractive index in your mounting media preferably something that is either the same as the cells or the same as glass and um, sometimes it's solid, sometimes it's liquid. When we're doing fluorescence, um, it, and if, if it's solid, it wasn't solid to start with usually, <laughs> becomes solid. When we're doing fluorescence microscopy, it's gonna be a liquid. It's gonna be something actually called, um, frequently it's PBS, um, which is phosphate buffered saline. It's just a nice, gentle, um, slightly salted water, which is what cells and tissues love. 
and uh, it might have some pH stability, you know, so, some uh, ways to stabilize the pH in there. But it almost always, and why I'm going on about this is because you can buy mounting media and it just says, this is mounting media. <laughs> for fluorescence and they won't even tell you what's in it but they almost always will have an anti-fade solution in there if they're going to sell you mounting media for fluorescence because it's cheap and they're smarter than that they know like you're not going to come back and use it if your specimen kept bleaching so you can buy your own um, anti-fade and add it to pbs or you can buy pbs plus anti-fade and you know already done for you um, and one of my favorite things to say is bleach, bleaching and bubbles are the bane of biologists. I like saying it because it alliterates, but it's true. Like, um, really, they're the bane of microscopists because we are spending all this time trying to get bubbles out of our specimen when we mount it, when we make it, because bubbles love to land right over the best thing to look at. And they're going to distort the image in all kinds of ways. You're not going to be able to see anything. And then uh, if you don't have bubbles, you're gonna have, you have to contend with bleaching. So um, these are the struggles, basically. Okay, so here's uh, an example of some antifades, just so you can see time in seconds. This is really uh, surprisingly generous because <laughs> <laughs> whatever this floor for unnamed floor for is um if you see the dash line on the bottom you you could see it it was fluorescing at at zero by five seconds it's already you know much dimmer and after that it goes down to almost nothing it's dark it's black um so the bottom line where it disappears on you, basically the specimen disappears on you is what they're um, comparing it to. That's without anti-fade. And then if you add anti-fade, you'll, you'll get a bleaching curve that is better because, you know, it doesn't bleach. <laughs> and then I get a kick out of this because it was, where did I, I should really credit the source. This is marketing stuff. This is the kind of ridiculousness they market to you because they don't tell you what the specimen is or let's say the pH of it and the floor for and all that and this is um I feel like by the time it gets in the hand of the marketing people they're not the, the biologists have no say because I'm like if I had a specimen that lasted 10 seconds I'm already happy <laughs> Like that's pretty long. Not that, you know, not that I don't prefer it never to bleach, but also I don't buy that it never bleaches. I don't know what this specimen is, but this is all kind of made up. This is an extreme best case scenario. And then what's hilarious about this curve is that you add, you know, their newest, uh, I think their competitors sell slow fade and then they sell prolonged gold. Um, <laughs> which is also like who came up with that name, but it's actually good anti-fade despite the name. If you put it in that, suddenly it's even brighter, which is ridiculous. It shouldn't be brighter. It should just not bleach. Um, oh, you see PBS, phosphate buffate, uh, buffered so solution. So the phosphate acts as a pH stabilizer. It's not, it, it's not very, it's not a good stabilizer. <laughs> There's something known as heaps that's better, but PBS is just easy to make and we use it a lot. Uh, it's our equivalent of water for biologists because you don't want cells in actual water because they'll explode. Um, your cells are not in actual water. Your blood is salty, um, just like the oceans. So anyway, um, this is I, a, a somewhat entertaining marketing tool, but a very dramatic example <laughs> of like, oh my gosh, without anti-fade, it's going to disappear, which is true. It does. And then with anti-fade, it totally works. Um, and then, oh wait, wait, no, these people are the ones selling you, I got it wrong, these are the slow fade people <laughs> trying to sell you slow fade or slow fade light. Anyway, um, you can see all the other four curves that where the sample doesn't disappear are anti-fades. Okay, so how do we make sure we don't get bleaching? How can we counteract it? Basically, uh, we just want to limit the exposure to light and make it count when you do have to, um, you know, have light, use light, uh, make it count. So we tend to keep the slides in a box or wrap them in foil. Um, room light 
plants are so weak, they don't actually cause that much fading. So it's almost superstition, but it's really hard after you've dealt with a lot of bleaching to not <laughs> put your slides in an opaque box and, 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 you know, just leave them there until you're ready to use them. Um, and like I said, some of us even put them in the, um, fridge or freezer because it lasts longer supposedly as long as you don't get a little frost um, icicles. Um, the main and most important thing is to close the shutter on your scope when you're not actually imaging so you're not sending light to um, your sample. This It's really easy to get distracted and start talking to someone or start thinking about something or go write something down in your book, but you should always check and make sure that the shutter's closed. It's really easy to see on a fluorescent scope because you can look at the stage and you can see, oh, there's light, unless it's the um, UV 405, the red, the, all, the, all of the other colors we can see with our eyes. So it's just an easy reflex to look at the stage and, oh, shutter closed and you try to set it up so that your software will um, you know do that but usually your software doesn't there's often actually a button like sometimes a physical button that you're pressing to close the shutter the software will control the shutter and open it for you but it sometimes there it's very easy to leave your shutter open so it's just something that you have to think about if you're um, using a confocal there's a way to uh, scan it with a super fast rate when you're in live window. So in order to see, this is your first look at a specimen, um, you're going to work in a really grainy world <laughs> where, where you're just looking at it really fast and you're kind of like, you develop an instinct about, oh, that kind of grainy fuzz thing I'm seeing, oh, it's going to look so good <laughs> when, I, when I slow down and expose it to more light and um, it's going to just be beautiful. Um, you use, if you're on a wide field scope, you use the lowest exposure that gives you a good histogram. Okay, so um, you're just sort of saving your light, like I said, for when it counts. And um, it can be absolutely appropriate to take just a super quick snap and look at that rather than uh, sit there and like you're trying to decide about it. Should I take an image? What's going on? Don't do that. <laughs> Take a quick snap and close the shutter and stare at your quick snap and go like, do I want this or do, you know, do I want to bother taking a good version of this? Do I need to move it over, et cetera? And mostly you just get pretty good at being fast on the scope, to be honest. That's a lot of it. You just know where your things are. You know where your hands need to go. You know how your software works and so on. Okay, so the opposite of bleaching. Let's talk a little bit about autofluorescence. So where do we get autofluorescence? Um, with this uh, online class, unfortunately, you didn't get to do something called Project Flying Fluorescence, which is where I have you bring in specimens and sort of search for yourself and figure it out and figure out what does autofluoresce and what doesn't. You make your own slides. Um, you might still do that in the fall because it's really fun to do. And it's, again, the thing of like, believe it because you did it. And you should barely believe the stuff you do, let alone what other people tell you, right? Because you're a skeptic scientist. Okay, so, but <laughs> hopefully you get to verify this. Um, what we do find, um, where we do find autofluorescence is in plants. So plants are the direct opposite of mammalian cells. Mammalian cells like humans and um, other, thing, other mammals we study, um, they tend not to fluoresce on their own. This is why we have to have uh, fluorescent proteins added to them or conjugated fluorophores, conjugated to antibodies and so on. Um, we have to do all sorts of things to get the uh, mammalian cells to fluoresce, also, you know, animal cells in general, insects, whatever you're looking at. On the other hand, plants, they fluoresce. So if you're working on plants, you actually have the opposite problem of they're highly fluorescent and you're kind of stuck with what fluoresces <laughs> and it's very hard to add fluorescence or look at particular things. It's a whole struggle in the plant world. 
Um, so it's a good bad thing sort of. Uh, with mammals, nothing's fluorescing, so we can decide what gets to fluoresce. With plants, your the cell wall fluoresces really brightly. And um, that's the we think it's the linen um, in the cell wall, but it's clearly other molecules too. And um, last I checked, <laughs> We don't really understand it. Um, I say this because I knew somebody was working on it and trying to figure out why does the cell wall fluoresce? Not only does it fluoresce, but it's here's the thing, it doesn't bleach. So what is going on? And that is true even in fixed slides. So it's not that it's alive and creating new fluorophores, it's even in fixed slides. Um, you see almost no bleaching uh, of cell walls. You can just keep looking at them, they're great. Plants have chloroplasts, which are experts at light because that's what they do, right? <laughs> they, they use the light of the sun. And I mean, that's what plants do. And also photosynthetic bacteria, they give you um, all sorts of goodies um, by using the energy of the sun. So, um, Chloroplasts we know absorb blue violet and they have various colors that are emitted, including red. Um, and yeah, so plants are really autofluorescent. Now, in in all cells, including mammalian and you know, including human cells, it turns out that vitamins fluoresce. And if you want, crush up some vitamins and bring them in. <laughs> and see if that's true. We had a year where some people found their cheek cells were fluorescing. And um, Amy, I think it was Amy Choi, um, was so bugged by this because they shouldn't. They're mammalian cells. <laughs> and, and we were like, why do some people have fluorescent cheek cells? What is going on here? Um, she figured it out. She did a little study. And they it was people had taken a lot of vitamins before they screened, you know, like, eaten a vitamin a pill or something. And so it had kind of coated their cheek cells. Um, so anyway, that was sort of amusing. So vitamins uh, fluoresce, NADH, NAD, uh, pH. Uh, so these are molecules that are part of your metabolism that are found in your cells and some fatty acids actually fluoresce. Now here's the thing. All these, all these molecules I just mentioned fluoresce in mammalian cells, but they're not very bright at all. So for instance, on our scopes, you won't see them unless you bring straight up bunch of vitamin, a pill, crush up a pill, and there's like enough, or in the case of these people's cheek cells, they had like a lot of vitamin coating them, but you don't see it in your normal cheek cells. There's vitamins in there. There's just too few to see. We're not giving it bright enough light. We don't have sensitive enough cameras, et cetera. But lately, I would say in the last, oh, eight to 10 years, our technology has gotten better. Um, and in fact, at the AIM conference, I think some people were talking about using autofluorescence diagnostically because they have good enough systems that can pick up um, autofluorescence even in human tissues. Um, I, not on the list, but I really should add it is also the, so there's something called the extracellular matrix that are the molecules that, uh, are outside of your cells and give structure to a tissue. For instance, you've heard of collagen, that's a famous one. And um, tumors happen to have a very um, autofluorescent ECM for some, we don't really understand why, but they do. And so there's somebody who has adapted a confocal to be able to scan people's skin while the skin's still on them. <laughs> it's totally non-invasive, doesn't hurt. Um, you're basically shining light at somebody's skin and you just, you know, sort of scan it. Um, it's actually this little tiny thing that just, um, you just sort of like a tiny, tiny wand that you run over people's arms and so on. Um, and it's able to pick up autofluorescence from any skin tumors you might have that are still not visible on the surface, but are in the deeper layer. So there are things that autofluoresce and autofluorescence is kind of coming of age as the scope gets better. Um, oh, <laughs> so uh, as you, 
well, no, I haven't said this before, but if you're going to get out of fluorescence, it tends to be, be in the blue or UV uh, excitation range. You don't get so much red out of fluorescence. Um, and this is an important thing. Fixing a specimen with formaldehyde or other aldehydes, but usually formaldehyde, can create autofluorescence. This is really important because a lot of times we fix cells with formaldehyde because it's a great fixative, but it can create its own autofluorescence, um, which is why there are controls in microscopy, despite what people <laughs> like to think or forget about. You have to really do a negative control every time you stain a cell you should have another parallel slide of the same uh, cells going through all of the same conditions except leave out the stain. <laughs> um, so fix them, wash them, do all the things you're doing to the stain cells, but don't add stain to them. And then compare this, this is a negative control, right? So compare the, the unstained cells to the stained cells because you might be thinking you're looking at an exciting result, but you're just looking at autofluorescence from formaldehyde. And um, it's gonna depend on your protocol, on your cells, on a, a number of things, whether the formaldehyde does show up, but um, you need to check basically. <laughs> okay, so otherwise you can waste a lot of time on some, uh, you know, on a red herring basically. Um, autofluorescence, as I sort of said, tends to be very photostable for whatever reasons that we're still trying to figure out. And um, like I said, we're now actually using it clinically in various situations. All right. Here we go with a whole new concept that you're going to get to wrap your mind around. So this is going to exercise your brain a little bit, but it's very powerful knowledge because you'll often find you're the only one in the lab who understands this. So in a microscopy lab, this is, is really good to understand bleed through. So bleed through is another issue that we need to be aware of when we're interpreting our data, when we're setting up the experiment, et cetera. And this is why, I, bleed through is kind of why I take you through all the spectra and figuring that out because we're going to use the knowledge that you've acquired so far to hunt for bleed through and um, not have it. We don't want bleed through basically. So as you already know, when you uh, stain um, a specimen with two or three or four or five even sometimes uh, different fluorophores, it's known as multiplexing. So this has nothing to do with theaters, like movie theaters, <laughs> and everything to do with multiple fluorophores, multiple colors. And um, most people like to do at least three. It's like, if I'm gonna do one, I might as well do three, because really it's not that much more work. Um, takes a little more time, but you know, while you're there, throw on some nuclear stains, why not? So you have to plan an experiment out before. And you already know that you have to um, figure out if, if you can actually um, fit all the spectra on, you know, if they overlap or not. And here's, um, you, I've been sort of hinting this, but the real reason you're doing that is to check for bleed through. Okay. You, you of course have to make sure you have the right filter sets. You have to think about, um, you know, are there good antibodies if we're talking um, uh, fixed um, conjugatable fluorophores. Um, I mentioned that because there's, uh, surprising to me, there's a, a huge amount of companies that make fluorescent uh, antibodies. And um, when you go to the conference, there's just an enormous amount of these small companies making fluorescent antibodies trying to sell them to you. And most of them don't work. I've never understood how these companies stay in existence <laughs> because you can buy really bad uh, fluorophores basically or fluorescently conjugated antibodies. So when you're doing something known as IHC uh, indirect histochemistry or IIF um, indirect immunofluorescence, which you're gonna learn about more in 102, um, it's 
bizarrely easy to buy something that doesn't work. And then they are always like, well, you did it wrong and you know, whatever. You know? <laughs> so um, that's a consideration. You sort of have to do like the grapevine, like, oh, someone else used this. OK, it works. Um, so we're going to we're going to look at, you've already looked at what filter sets do you have? Do you have the correct filter sets to match the floor fours? Now we're going to um, figure out how to look for bleed through. So it's an important concern. And bleed through is also known as crossover because we're biologists, remember? <laughs> we have two to five names for everything, right? Why settle for one name when you could have two? Okay, so what is it? Bleed through is when a fluorophore appears in the channel reserve for a different fluorophore. So you think you're looking at the signal from green, but you're actually looking at the signal from red, or you think you're looking at the, um, you know, Texas red stained um, cells, but you're actually looking at the ones that are stained with, Fitzy or Alexa 488. So you you think you're looking at cells that are stained red, but no, you're looking at cells that are stained green. Remember your camera is a black and white camera, okay? So <laughs> you're just seeing signal and you have a black and white camera because you're more sensitive because you're getting all of the signal, but you're not keeping the color info. You're just keeping the info that it, you got this signal in this place in your specimen when you looked at it with a certain filter cube, in other words, a certain channel. And so you're expecting red and you're seeing red, but it's coming not from uh, protein B, which is stained red, but from protein A, which was stained green. So how can you figure this out? Well, you have to set up the experiment correctly <laughs> is how you do it. So this is a great example of, um, a random specimen that, again, they don't tell you what it is, um, but it's also from the Davidson um, website. And um, it's showing you on the, on the top, it's showing you the green channel. So there's some cells, oh look, they're green. And then it's showing you the red channel. Oh look, everything's red. <laughs> and then it's showing you the uh, composite or overlay image in C that's, oh, green plus red, most of it's yellow basically. So um, that's what you, you would get if you weren't paying attention and you just image, la la la, I'm not gonna pay attention to the um, spectra of these fluorophores. Um, what you're seeing in B, image B with all that red is actually bleed through from the green. So B is actually its own composite image already. <laughs> if you'll notice B and C look pretty similar, that's because they are the same image. So when you're looking at A in this situation, you're only seeing the signal from the green protein. When you're looking at B in this situation, you're seeing the signal from the red protein, but also the green protein. And it's showing up as red. Why? Because you told your scope in the software that this is the red filter cube. And so although it's a black and white image, apply a color lookup table to it, make it red, paint it red. And, and you're like, wow, everything's red. The truth is that no, not everything's red. Let's look at uh, images D, E, and F where they've done the experiment properly with a better filter set basically. And D is still the image, the green image. So that was correct. If you look at A and D, they're the same, right? That's your real green signal. But look at E. E is not everything. That's your real red signal. Your real red signal is totally different than your real green signal. It's everywhere the green isn't, there's red. And so when you do a composite, a real composite with F, you don't even see any yellow. You don't see any overlap. You just see green where you know the first molecule is and you see red in a totally different part of your specimen where the second molecule is located. And they are separate. These molecules don't even interact in real life. <laughs> They're not in the same location. So D, E, and F is real data. 
A, B, C is artifact, in other words, uh, fake data. <laughs> and it's it's because A is good, yeah, that's information, but B is already your composite. <laughs> Compare B to E. So B is badly done experiment and E is a correctly done experiment looking for the signal from the red molecule. Okay, so the first row is an example of bleed through from the green into the red. So you look at the green channel, oh, there it is. You look at the red channel, you're seeing the red channel and the green channel. <laughs> so your green is bleeding through into the red channel and confusing the heck out of you and giving you bad info because you think that these two molecules are in the same place. They aren't. They are totally separate molecules, but it's just that green is showing up unwanted and pretending to be red, but it's not. Okay, so how do you know? <laughs> well, you have to go back to the basics and look up the spectra on the fluorophore that you're using on all the fluorophores. Um, so in in this case, it was two fluorophores. Um, you should know what fluorophores you're using because you did it, you manipulated the specimen. Um, and then you also have to look at the filter cube info. And then you can know. That's the only way you can know. You cannot know by looking at the image. You have to know by knowing how you set it up with what fluorophores and what filter cubes. And a lot of people, I got to tell you, don't bother to do that. Um, and that's not good. So in order for bleed through to happen, you first have to be able to excite both fluorophores at the same time. This is a really important concept and think about it. So in the previous image, let's come back here, where green is showing up in the red channel, that's because you are exciting both green and red to get image B. You think you're only exciting the red, but no, <laughs> you're exciting the green molecule and the red molecule, and you're seeing the signal from both of them, and you're interpreting it as red because that you expect only red, but you set up the experiment badly. Um, in the second row, you set it up properly. So when you switch to the red filter cube, you're not exciting the green at all. Um, so even though the green has a spectra that goes all the way into red, you're not seeing it because you didn't even excite it. So there's nothing to see. There's no chance for green to show up in the red channel. Okay, so coming back to this, it's like a prerequisite for bleed through. <laughs> Can you, uh, are you able to, are you exciting both fluorophores at the same time. Not just are you able to, but did you? Did you actually do that based on the filter set or the light source that you use? Did you accidentally excite two fluorophores at once? If so, if you did that, then are you collecting the signal from both of them in what you think is one channel, okay? So first you have to excite them both. And then sometimes you can excite them both and separate out their signal. It's hard to do. It's easier to just not excite them both. <laughs> but technically you could excite them both and then just collect only the red and not the green. Um, as you can imagine, like that's harder to do. But there's two things that have to happen um, for you to have bleed through. One is you have to excite both fluorophores Bleed through is usually between two fluorophores. So, I mean, you can end up with three colors in one channel, but you're really doing it wrong <laughs> if you're ending up with three colors. Usually you're ending up with one other color sneaking in, bleeding through into your channel. Um, so, so first, are you uh, exciting both of them at the same time? And second, are you collecting both of them at the same time? If so, your data is kind of worthless, or at least know that you're doing that. Um, as you can imagine, long pass filters are, um, you know, bleed throughs best friend, basically. <laughs> and narrow band pass filters are your best friend to avoid bleed through if you're gonna multiplex. 
are, as I say, very out of fluorescent samples. So we're, I'm kind of ignoring out of fluorescence for the moment. So we're going to just talk about bleed through in terms of um, situations where you control all the fluorescence. You've created the fluorescence by labeling things. And um, the reality is that certain combos of fluorophores work well together, while other combos are just bleed through disasters. And in fact, Fitzy and Rhodamine, the original green and red, have tons of bleed through. So a lot of the old data is kind of sketchy, to be honest. <laughs> they were doing the best they could at the time. But um, this is why we have more fluorophores and better uh, filter cubes with narrow band paths and so on. Um, and the thing is, people still, like if you're outside of the field or you just know well, don't know much, you might tend to be like, oh, I've heard of Fitzy and Rhodamine. I've read these old papers. Let's do that. No, no, no. <laughs> don't do that unless you don't care if there's bleed through, but usually you do. This is an entertaining example of just a hot mess of a situation. I'm so sorry I don't have the floor fours labeled, but if you look at the one that the look at the arrow to excitation one and excitation two. Those two um, excitation spectra basically overlap completely, <laughs> right? And you can see there's only one, uh, I think there's only one filter set. Yeah, there's only one filter set on them. And it, you're going to have a hard time exciting one and not exciting two or vice versa. Whatever you do, <laughs> you're going to excite both of them at the same time. Um, I mean, you can excite one in the four to 450 range, but it's going to be so dim, it's not worth it. Um, anywhere that it's worth exciting, any colors that are worth using are going to excite both of them at the same time. However, interestingly enough, you could separate out their emissions. So this is an unusual case. Um, you could separate out their emissions. If you look at emission one and two, this is unusual because um, 442 has a really huge Stokes radius, which is not common. But just to show you uh, kind of a weird situation, you could potentially uh, separate out the emissions, which is better than nothing. It's not great. But you can't do it with that band pass, <laughs> right? I mean, with that long pass, sorry, with that long pass filter set. Yeah, there's no way um, that's not going to work. So when we look at um, two floor fours and we're trying to figure out if they will um, if they will bleed into each other, if there will be bleed through, um, we're of course, trying to get what we say is the best spectral separation. So in other words, we want, in this case, um, we're just looking at the emission spectra. We want the emission spectra to be far away from each other as much as possible. So if you look at Alexa Floor 488 and Alexa Floor 555 in this first uh, example, it's kind of hard to separate their emissions. Um, and if you look at you know the next two examples are basically doable, like you can separate their emissions. So um, this is the emission. You also have to concurrently look at the excitation. <laughs> so again, you have to check the excitation, compare excitation and excitation. Am I going to excite them both? And then compare emission and emission. Am I going to collect the same emission? If both of those things are going to happen, then you're, you've got bleed through. If neither of those happen, then you don't have bleed through. <laughs> um, and this is an interesting, very common scenario. And again, now we go towards the Alexas, but it, it's sort of the same when you look at it, because we do, um, with, even with the Alexas, the Alexa, the greens and the reds that are Alexas. So let's look at, uh, on our left, it's just uh, the excitation spectra for DAPI, which is the super common, almost always used uh, um, dye for uh, the nucleus, for DNA. So there's the most common multiplex, it's DAPI, a green and a red, like it is here. So exciting those three, yeah-ish. Like you you'll notice that there's little tails in each, but, but you know, the red's the only one that you can guarantee is the only one excited. But, um, you know, blue, you're mostly exciting. The, the DAPI, the green, you're mostly exciting. The, uh, the Fitzy. Um, 
when you go over to the emission spectrum, it actually looks grim because <laughs> you're like, oh my God, Dappy and Fitzy, they practically overlap. How can I tell them apart? Well, you actually can't entirely, but you can mostly because, um, <laughs> well, when you look at um, Dappy, you're mostly exciting Dappy. And this, quite honestly, this is an example of a workable situation, uh, also because we know by now that Dappy is only in the nucleus, et cetera. But it's not a perfect situation. It would that fitzy little tail. You are getting a some percentage of bleed through. Um, the by little tail. Let's see if um, I mean um, if you look at about three fifty, you can see that your that's your peak for exciting dappy. But you're exciting fitzy a tiny bit too. So it's dim. You're mostly not going to see it, but it's not super great. Um, and um, let's see, I think I have, <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a t uh, the, this issue of the tail um, here for you with uh, Fitzy and what's the red? Alexa Floor. Okay, so a uh, green and a red. But if you come back here, you'll see the same situations happening with Dappy and the Fitzy on the excitation side, and actually with the Fitzy and the Texas red. <laughs> So um, it's a thing. So this is looking at the question, can you excite both with, um, with one filter or in this case laser? Can you excite both at the same time? And the answer is yes, with the 488 laser. Um, so here we're using a laser, which is just a single line of color instead of a, a narrow bandpass filter set. But um, it's the same concept. Like you shine light of 480 nanometers, you're gonna you're gonna get a big response from the molecules that are labeled with Fitzy from Fitzy, the floor for itself, whatever it's attached to, um, wherever it is. You're gonna get yeah, a lot of that happening. But you're gonna get a few <laughs> of the uh, molecules that are labeled with the red also reacting and they're also going to show up in your channel well it's prerequisite you know or requisite number one can we excite them both and do we need to check the emission to make sure there's no bleed through yes we can excite we can excite both the red and green using the 488 uh, laser can we excite both of them with the 568 laser no that's clean your red image is clean like, because you're only exciting the red, that's it. So it depends on the laser or, you know, the filter cube. Here's a situation that's basically impossible to ever resolve, <laughs> okay? So green fluorescent protein was invented and everybody got excited, changed the world, uh, led to a dramatic expansion of fluorescence microscopy in all fields and, um, you know, technological advancements in the scopes, because now everybody's using them, lots of jobs, the creation of the Merit Microscopy Program, all of that, <laughs> thanks to green fluorescent protein, because now we can safely, non-toxically, stably label live um, cells, tissues, animals, anything, everything. It's so cool. Um, and er immediately everybody said, I want to multiplex. I want to see two molecules in relationship to each other or two cells, you know, are they next to each other? Are they far away, et cetera? Are they interacting? What's going on? Um, this is so exciting. Can we have another color? And so the Chen lab that um, brought us GFP uh, came out pretty soon after with the second color, YFP. And everybody was like, hooray, I can multiplex. And quickly the answer was, no, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> because look at these two. <laughs> it's really hard not to excite both and also not to catch, like their emissions are practically overlapping. So um, it's really hard to use these to multiplex, basically. People tried and did all kinds of acrobatics, but really they should not be used together. Fortunately, the Chen Lab came out with a lot of other colors. Um, you're going to see them in the GFP lecture. 
And um, so people stepped away from it. But what's cool about this, uh, although it was initially quite disappointing, um, it has turned these two um, turned into a whole new technique called FRET, F-R-E-T, which I'll talk about a little bit, I think, in the last lecture, and you'll learn about more next semester. Because they are so close together, as it turns out, if you excite one, the emission from GFP actually excites YFP. And so you only see the YFP. So you're using GFP to be your excitation, basically. So you excite GFP, its emission excites YFP because they're so close together. And you get all kinds of magic out of this. <laughs> they're, they're the first as they're now known the first fret pair. Like you can fret these two. You can't fret every pair of fluorophores. They have to be practically overlapping like this. And fret only works um, if the two molecules that are labeled are really, really, really close together, like angstrom level close together. And in cells, a lot of um, what happens depends on proximity. So molecules have to be close together to interact. And this is a great way to figure out a lot of things about what is going on in cells, because you have a way to assay whether two molecules are super, super close together enough to chemically interact, or are they, you know, nanometers away, and in which case they might as well be in different planets or parts of the cell um, in terms of their ability to mess with each other or inter interact directly. Okay, so it's a it's bond a whole field. Like there's a zillion people out there still doing frat, trying to figure out things like the shape of a protein. Um, a frequent speaker at the AIM conference, uh, Stephen Vogel uses FRAT to, at, he's at NIH, he uses it to figure out how memory works because there's a molecule in the neurons in our brain that are known to be really important for memory that seems to change its really fascinating and complicated shape. It has 12 subparts and they kind of swing out and then hold their shape when uh, memory is created and um, he uses FRET. So just an example of things that were the kind of questions we're asking using this. Okay, so um, coming back to autofluorescence, it technically isn't bleed through if it's autofluorescence, <laughs> um, but we use that term anyway. So we do say it just because it's handy, um, you know, so you might go through all the steps and check out the spectra of the fluorophores that you're using and check out the filter cubes, make sure everything's clean, there's no bleed through, and you might end up with autofluorescence. <laughs> so how can you make sure you're not looking at autofluorescence or that it's not you know, bleeding through into one of the channels, so to speak, showing up as an unwelcome guest, shall we say? Um, and <laughs> as, you, as I say that, I'm like, Biology or science is really good at turning unwelcome guests into a completely new field. <laughs> so, you know, something that at first is like, oh no, is like, oh, but <laughs> actually we can, however, instead use this in this way. Okay, so um, yeah, let's, <laughs> is there such a thing as an unwelcome guest? That's a philosophical question we can have fun with. But in that current experiment that you're doing, you're like, I don't want to see autofluorescence. How do you know that you have it? Simple, controls. Life is about controls, right? Um, you need to, in parallel to your stain slides, you need to have an unstained control slide at least one every time you run an experiment. Um, and then you'll know, oh, I said this before. I'm like, this sounds familiar. I already said this earlier, but it's good to rehash and re-say it because it's really important. You can compare it to your stained experimental slides. And I think I talked to you more about more controls later. So, oh, here it is. <laughs> good. <laughs> So if you're multiplexing, you think an unstained slide is enough of a control? No, never enough controls. What you also have to do is an unstained 
so the unstained slide is your negative control, but you have to do a single stain slide for each floor for, which is somewhere between a negative and positive control. Um, it's a control. Um, you basically, let's say you're staining for dappy, fitzy, and a red, a, a blue, red, and a green uh, floor of four. You have to have something treated the same, fixed everything, all the same, except you don't add any fluorophores to it. And then you have to have a DAPI only slide, a red only slide, a green only slide, and then you have your experimental run, which is all three. And to be honest, you should do multiples <laughs> of all of these because at least, you know, three each or something, if you're being really careful and if it matters, because um, things can go wrong and, uh, we like uneven numbers because um, best out of three basically is sort of the idea or best out of five. Uh, but here, these are the kind of controls that you need to be doing. And so, you know, even at the most basic level, if you're trying to triple stain something, you have to have four slides total, at least, you know, one that's unstained entirely, one that's stained for the first color, one that's just the second color, one's that just the third color and then one that's all three colors together and you're still checking the spectra and um, the filter sets and making sure you don't have bleed through. Um, bleed through does tend to happen from the short wavelengths into the long wavelengths like you saw green into red so red tends to be the most sort of we can trust that image kind of color <laughs> uh, just because the way the fluorophore spectra work and their tails and so on. But, um, you know, if you're being lazy, <laughs> you're like, red is probably okay, but the greens and the blues, heavens knows, we got to check those. Um, and here's a further complication. And um, I'm realizing I don't have enough pictures to show you of the right filter set, but that's because it's in project spectra or assignment spectra that you're going to do. So I have images of like how you figure out, you know, pick a filter set that works uh, for multiplexing. So we'll probably do that in the lab, uh, lab zoom also. I'll go for some examples. So that's the basics of uh, bleed through. Here's, here's a fancy twist. And I gotta tell you, again, if you're in a lab setting, the fact that you understand bleed through is already making you promotable, but, <laughs> and like, you know, be kind. <laughs> you know more than a lot of people know, be kind telling them their experiment's worthless, basically. Um, and they need to redo it all. Um, because they want it better and they want it more accurate, right? And they want to trust it. Anyway, so here's another issue that can kind of mess up things. If there's a huge difference in brightness between uh, fluorophores, um, it just makes it all worse, basically. Because remember when I said a spectra is a spectra in the beginning, but it's not really like, again, there's an asterisk to everything. When you look up a spectra, um, you're, you're like, I bought Alexa for uh, 488. Let me look it up on the molecular pro probes slash in vitro gen slash <laughs> life tech or whatever the name of the company is um, on their website. Oh, here's what the spectra looks like. Or even on, uh, to be honest, on a lot of software, um, when you're setting up the scope nowadays, they'll have a little database and you just call it up. And then, um, so you're like, oh, there's the spectra for this floor four. Yeah, mostly. <laughs> so, this is biology. Um, there's always an asterisk and always a like, well, except kind of, and, and you already know some except, except, well, if the pH is off, your, your spectrum might be slightly different. If it's bound to something, it might be slightly different. Here's another fun one. If it's super bright, your spectrum will be slightly different. Brightness actually affects the spectra. I'm going to show you how on the next slide. So the useful tip is to design an experiment well, use your brightest fluorophore for whatever molecule or part of your specimen is the least bright. There's the less of it. So, you know, there's just a little bit of signal. Make that your brightest signal. Um, but it is totally possible for a discrepancy in brightness to bleed, cause bleed through where if they were equally bright, maybe you wouldn't have that. So super bright, really abundant fluorophore can drown out basically a dim, easily bleached, low quantity fluorophore. 
Um, so this shows you uh, with the green lines, it shows you the same floor for, but the spectra sort of expands if there's a lot of it, if it's bright, if things are good so that it's, you know, the pH is right and whatever the conditions are such um, that it's super bright. And you can see where um, the, the sort of spectra that's off the chart is totally just bleeding through into that uh, so into the rhodamine, which is drawn with a yellow line. Heavens knows why it should be red, but whatever. So you can see like if in the case of in the first line, if you have just a little bit of fluorescine, you're still, this is an example of like, don't do it anyway. <laughs> you're still going to have a lot of problems, but maybe you can math your way out of that situation. Um, but as I'll show you in a moment, but um, in a, the case of, um, these are really not well labeled, but in the case of the, where there's just more and it's brighter, um, like the last green line, you've basically just swamped out that rhodamine signal and you can't tell it apart from the fluorescein signal. Um, and it's not showing you the excitation, but of course this is dependent. We're assuming they were both excited at the same time. And if the fluorescein is super bright, then you're just out of luck with ever seeing the rhodamine on its own. Okay, so um, you might also come across the term crosstalk. Crosstalk is the fact that you excited two fluorophores at the same time, you know, with the same laser line or excitation filter. So crosstalk is the what I'm calling the prerequisite or step one of two steps. You know, you have to have crosstalk to get bleed through, also known as crossover. And that's when you bleed through crossovers when you're collecting two fluorophores at the same time with the same emission filter. But there aren't two fluorophores to collect unless you excited them both. Okay. Um, and because you have to have crosstalk to get crossover, people will sort of lump them together, okay? They're not super careful about which one they're using when they're, they're talking, just so you know. And autofluorescence, they just throw it all in. Basically, they're saying messed up. I can't tell <laughs> what's what. <laughs> and crossover, crosstalk, bleed through, it's all that, it's, it's that pile of difficulty, basically. So, um, scope manufacturers to the rescue <laughs> and actually math to the rescue. When you buy a half million dollar uh, confocal and they tell you you can't really image things in more than one color because, you know, bleed through, people tend to get a little upset. And so, <laughs> so the, um, the vendors uh, or the developers um, very <laughs> thoughtfully did a really good job of figuring out um, how to create spectral separation. If you know the spectra of the fluorophores that you're using, you can use math to separate out the emissions. And you can basically, what it's going to look like when you're doing this on the confoco is your green gets greener, your red gets redder. And if you're looking through papers, you can see when this became commercially available, because before then all the reds were kind of yellow <laughs> in people's published uh, research. And the greens were kind of, everything was kind of yellowish. And then, because um, that was how it really is. And then um, now everybody just sort of hits the spectral separation button and, until everything is just, you know, extra clearly green and extra clearly red. And, um, and the good news is it's legit because it's legit as long as your fluorophore is acting like the spectra that it's supposed to act like. It's having a day where <laughs> the spectra is, is actually what the company says it is. If you're a super careful microscopist, you're going to double check because if you're using a confocal, you can actually find out what the spectra is that day, given those cells, given your particular experiment, given your particular pH of what's going on. Um, 
you can use that single stain control slide and quickly get a spectra. It really doesn't take long. It's a matter of minutes. And you can plug it in to the software and your spectral separation where you're going to pull out the bleed through mathematically is all the better. So if you're being quantitative or you know, be careful. Again, this is sort of an advanced trick, but it's a very important one um, to make sure that you're getting real data and not just chasing red herrings in your image or green herrings, as it were. <laughs> green herrings showing up in your red channel. No, we don't want that. Okay, so um, <laughs> after all this, you can imagine that if you see a multiband filter, you recoil in horror. You're like, why did they make this? Here, let me show you one where this is on purpose, simultaneously catching multiple fluorophores. What? You really don't know what's going on now. <laughs> this is my reaction, a lot of people's reaction when they were selling them and when they start popping up on scopes and we're like, why? Why would you ever use this? And the answer is it's really fun in the oculars because <laughs> you see a triple stain thing you see all three colors in the oculars but um it has massive issues with bleed through as you can imagine and also makes things and there's dimness dimness issues too because you're kind of looking at going forward um and i like to point this out because actually um now now that we have led lights um, for even wide field scopes, um, we could cheaply create <laughs> a 3D printed microscope, which already exists for, not for fluorescence, for just bright field. And we could use an LED programmable panel of lights and then just one filter set that is this exact you know multi-pass filter set and if you're only giving it one color at a time and exciting one fluorophore at a time having this filter set basically capture everything and anything <laughs> is not a problem because you're only looking at one fluorophore at a time and i mentioned this because this is exactly what we're planning to do with the advanced students next year in BioSci 103 and 104. There's a collaborator at Laney who's made some 3D printed regular scopes and Ben Smith from Berkeley came up with this idea to use this filter set, use LEDs like I just described and I'm trying to get you to sign up for 103 and 104 because you'll be able to do it. And to 3D print them, the cost of the scopes is, I forget, but it's super low. It's like tens of dollars or something. It's it's um, it's basically the cost of the filter. I mean, it, it makes a good scope really cheap. And so we're trying to have these small portable um, scopes that we're creating. Um, that's a sort of science for everyone. And um, there's a lot of bright field cheap scopes, but there aren't cheap fluorescent scopes. So not everybody gets to have fluorescent scopes. We're actually hoping <laughs> to do it in time to send them home with you, but that didn't work out. But um, join us. Take, uh, well, you're going to take 102, but, you know, keep, keep going with us in the program, basically. So I think that's it. Just some acknowledgement of where I got some of these pictures and that is it. Enjoy your week. And as you're studying this, this might be a good time to start assignment spectra because it's completely related to all of this.